One of my favorite pastimes of the past year has been poker, Texas Hold'em specifically. I'm not a natural strategic mastermind, like my wife, when it comes to strategy games of any sort. Texas Hold'em is no exception. Over the past year, I've been learning how to play poker from six-time World Series of Poker champion Daniel Negranu. Negranu is one of many renowned experts that Masterclass has to teach you how to do what's important to you. I've been watching Negranu's nearly 30 lessons on poker, embedded with many of his examples from TV tournaments spliced in. Daniel Negranu's Masterclass on Texas Hold'em has really helped me grow fundamentally sound at Texas Hold'em. There are hundreds of other experts who can help you grow various professional skills or your abilities in various hobbies. Check out Masterclass today using my link in the show notes. If you treat yourself to Masterclass using that link, you'll also be supporting the show. This is Forgotten Wars. One of the most famous leaders of the 20th century wrote the following about events that happened in November of 1899. Quote, Yesterday, I traveled with the armored train. This armored train is a very puny specimen, having neither gun nor maxims, with no roof to its trucks and no shutters to its loopholes, and being in every way inferior to the powerful machines I saw working along the southern frontier. Nevertheless, it is a useful means of reconnaissance, nor is a journey in it devoid of interest. An armored train... The very name sounds strange, a locomotive disguised as a knight errant, the agent of civilization in the habiliments of chivalry, end quote. Days earlier, this correspondent for the Morning Post reached Durban on November 4th, two days after the Boers laid siege to Lady Smith. British wounded lay aboard the nearby hospital ship, the Sumatra. The Morning Post correspondent interviewed soldiers there, including one officer wounded at Elon's Lochter, who said, quote, All these colonials tell you that the Boers only want one good thrashing to satisfy them. Don't you believe it? They mean going through this to the end. What about our government? Winston Churchill brought a smile to this wounded officer's face, saying that the British were indeed united at home, and would not let the Boers outlast them. Less than a month later, Winston would more than see the wounds of others, and have more than just second-hand accounts to write about. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire, but that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks, act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. For those of you who know enough about Winston Churchill to like or dislike him, but haven't read a biography of him yet, I'll provide some of his fascinating background here. The American-born Jenny Jerome, later known as Lady Randolph Churchill, gave birth to Winston in 1874. She and Lord Randolph Churchill were parents all too typical for their class. They were both terrible and distant. Winston could not even get them to visit him for Christmas during his boarding school days, though he begged so persistently in letters to them. Winston kept a picture up on his bedroom wall that would strike many of us as odd today, but was actually typical for boys with his upbringing. Winston kept a picture of his nanny, the true maternal figure in his life, up on his bedroom wall into adulthood, even into marriage. 
as either a conscious or perhaps unconscious way to get back at his parents, Winston constantly opposed many school authorities anywhere he went to boarding school. Winston hated Latin, and well, Winston hated most subjects at school. He performed at the bottom of his class most years. He did find history interesting, and he discovered natural talent as a writer much later into his life as a student. Winston admired his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, who was indeed a towering figure in British Parliament. Winston still stood up for his father against any critics when Lord Randolph Starr began its rapid descent in Parliament. But Lord Randolph sadly never showed that he cared for his son at all. Lord Randolph Churchill died in 1895. So Winston would rely on his mom and her boyfriends for help in advancing his career as a writer and a fighter. The same year that Lord Randolph breathed his last, Winston Churchill began his career as a war correspondent in Cuba. Winston wrote five stories for the graphic about the Cuban insurrection there. Believe it or not, we will come back to that Cuban insurrection later this season because that insurrection actually relates much more than you'd think to how total war was waged in South Africa. Jenny Churchill then worked her connections to get Winston a role as war correspondent for both the Pioneer newspaper and the Daily Telegraph while accompanying the Malakand Field Force to India's northwest frontier in 1896. Winston not only kept his readers excited, Winston himself filled with excitement. Winston not only kept his readers excited, Winston himself filled with excitement. Churchill wrote his mother with excitement about an upcoming clash the Malakan Field Force would have with enemy tribes in September 1897. Quote, At the first opportunity, I am to be put on the strength of this force, which will give me a medal if I come through. As to the fighting, we march tomorrow, and before the week is out, there will be a battle, probably the biggest yet fought on the frontier this year. End quote. Winston boastfully, yet prophetically, told his mother something along the lines of, I have faith in my star, that is, that I am intended to do something in the world. On one occasion, Winston bravely commanded a company of Punjab infantry when all their officers had fallen in battle. Winston rode up and down the battle line on his pony, while others took cover. Winston was brave and Winston was rash. Winston eventually wrote a book about his time as a war correspondent in India, titled The Story of the Malakand. The Story of the Malakand received high praise, praise he had so rarely received from anyone up to that point. That same year of 1898 that Winston's book received high praise, Winston wrote as a young lieutenant and as a correspondent for the Morning Post with the 21st Lancers as part of General Herbert Kitchener's campaign to retake Sudan. Winston saw plenty of action. Winston wrote about a particular clash with the dervishes, where he saw many of his companions slashed beyond recognition. Then, just minutes later, when the battle turned against the dervishes, dervishes who didn't escape to their stronghold in Omdurman threw up their arms in surrender, seeking food, water, and civility. During this same Kitchener campaign, Churchill offered his own skin for a skin graft to a fellow wounded British soldier. Winston received no anesthesia during his skin donation. Winston reported later that this hurt like the devil. Winston chased danger in Sudan much like he did in India. Winston then wrote another book, The River War where he detailed this campaign in Sudan. Winston was offered an opportunity to run for a seat in British Parliament on behalf of the Conservative Party. But Winston didn't have enough money at that point. Winston went to South Africa aboard General Redford's Buller's ship as a Morning Post correspondent and as somehow also a British officer. Then 
Winston managed his way into a dinner at Alfred Milner's governor house in the Cape Colony thanks to a letter from Joseph Chamberlain. Remember, Churchill at this point is only 24 years old. Then Winston showed some real brazen balls by elbowing his way into a conversation between Alfred Milner and General Buller. Winston didn't let his youth stop him from criticizing Milner's colonial policy to his face and then turning to General Buller to offer advice on how to wage war in South Africa. A 24-year-old journalist telling a battle-hardened general how to make war. Now that's rich. Buller, being a blunt man a few words, told Churchill not to, quote, be a young ass. Though Churchill wasn't immediately rejected from South Africa for his unsolicited advice, he did leave the Cape Colony shortly after this dinner, with Milner and Buller. Churchill headed for Natal. He reached Durban by steamer at midnight on November 4th. As we said at the top of the episode, Winston interviewed several men aboard the Sumatra hospital ship. Soon enough, Churchill rode aboard an armored train that patrolled parts of Natal. At one of the stops, several Africans approached, respectfully saluting. A Natal volunteer questioned them. Are there Dutchmen nearby? How many? The Africans' answers were all over the place. 12, or 17, or 1,000. Also, the Dutchmen have a gun, or five guns mounted in the old fort, or on the platform of the station, or on the hill behind the town. It only takes one shell to do the trick with the engine, said the captain who commanded. Gotta hit us first, though, he added. Well, let's get a little bit near. Churchill interviewed the Natawa volunteer, who interviewed the Africans earlier. Durban Light Infantry, said the volunteer, that's my corps. I'm a builder myself by trade, nine men under me. But I had to send them all away when I was called out. I wish I was in Ladysmith. You see, these Dutchmen have come quite far enough into our country. The imperial government promised us protection. You've seen what protection Colenso got, Dundee and Newcastle just the same. I don't doubt they've tried their best, and I don't blame them, but we want help here badly. I don't hold with a man crying out for help unless he makes a start himself. So I came out. I'm a cyclist. I've got eight medals at home for cycling. Then Winston asked, How will you like a new one with the Queen's head on it? The volunteer's eye brightened. Ah, I should treasure that more than all the other eight, even more than the 20-mile championship one. But the more Churchill interviewed those on the British side, the more he was struck by the courage of the Boers. Quote, The enduring courage and confident spirit of the enemy must also excite surprise. In short, we have grossly underrated their fighting powers. Most people in England, I among them, thought that the Boer ultimatum was an act of desperation, that the Dutch would make one fight for their honor and, once defeated, would accept the inevitable. All I have heard and whatever I have seen out here contradict these. Later that month, the escort armored train was ordered to reconnoiter towards Chivali. Churchill describes the armored train for reasons you'll understand soon. Quote, The train was composed as follows. An ordinary truck in which was a seven-pound muzzle-loading gun served by four sailors from the Tartar. An armored car fitted with loopholes and held by three sections of a company of the Dublin Fusiliers. The engine and tender. Two more armored cars containing the fourth section of the Fusilier Company, one company of the Durban Light Infantry Volunteers, and a small civilian breakdown gang. Lastly, another ordinary truck with tools and materials for repairing the road. In all, five wagons, the locomotive, one small gun, and 120 men. End quote. As this escort armored train closed in on the town of Frere, Churchill and company saw something. But before I tell you what they saw, I'll tell you why they saw it. 
Before we move further, I wanted to ask that any of you listening on Apple Podcasts who haven't given us a five-star rating yet, I wanted to ask that you please do give us a five-star rating. I won't talk for as long as I did last episode about why that is so important to keeping the show going, but please know it's crucial for us. And next, I would ask that you all continue to share the show with friends of yours who like military history or just history in general. Thanks to the many of you who already have. Now back to the show. On November 9th, Commandant General Pete Yober held a council of war where he presented three options to his commandants. Option number one, they could try to storm Ladysmith before the British arrived. Option number two, they could divide their forces and dig in some of their forces along the Tugela River. Option number three, they could drive deeper into Natal and find ideal defensive positions near Durban. So many of Yobert's troops already were heading home that Yobert had to beg the government in Praetoria to do something about it. So the Praetoria government ordered railway authorities not to accept passengers traveling home without leave passes. Yobert had little hope in storming Lady Smith. They'd made a sorry attempt at storming Lady Smith that November 9th day, only to find they didn't have the heart or the structure for such an attack. The timid Yobert actually favored option three, driving deep into Natal towards Durban. But driving south had its obstacles. The Boers' horses hadn't recovered from previous days' fighting. The British had taken advantage of war inaction since the Battle of Lady Smith to swell Natal with as many reinforcements as they could. Division also fed into this. Orange Free State commandants held their own war council and refused to join a drive towards Durban. Free State Commandant General Martinez Prinz Lua broke this news to Yobert on November 11th. But Yobert stayed firm. Yobert headed south across the Tugela River with 1,500 Transvaalers and 500 Free Staters. Free Staters who refused to stick with Prinz Lua. 37-year-old Louis Buta rode beside Yobert. We will get more into this prodigy's life in an upcoming episode. On the evening of November 14th, Yobert's forces reached Chivali, just 20 miles away from Estcourt. Most of the 2,300 British forces in Natal stood guard at Estcourt. But Yobert and company sought to scout the surrounding area, not storm Estcourt. But then, an inconceivable stupidity, in the words of General Buller, put a certain armored train on a collision course with some of Yobert's men. Colonel Charles Long commanded the Estcourt garrison. Colonel Long continually sent armored train patrols along the railway line as far as Colenso. The armored trains did not have mounted troops to protect them. When Louis Bouta, leading an advanced column, saw the armored train just after dawn on November 15th, his men scattered rocks on the railway line just outside of Frere and then took up their positions along the railway. A great mist hung in the air as the armored train bearing Winston Churchill closed in. You'll now hear what happened from Winston Churchill's perspective. Quote, We were about a mile and three quarters from Frere when on rounding a corner, we saw that a hill which commanded the line at a distance of 600 yards was occupied by the enemy. So after all, there would be a fight, for we could not pass this point without coming under fire. The four sailors loaded their gun, an antiquated toy. The soldiers charged their magazines. The moment approached, but no one was much concerned, for the cars were proof against rifle fire, and this ridge could at worst be occupied only by some daring patrol of perhaps a score of men. Besides, we said to ourselves, they little think we have a gun on board. That will be a nice surprise. Suddenly, three wheeled things appeared on the crest, and with a second, a bright flash of light, like a heliograph, opened and shut ten or twelve times. Then two much larger flashes. No smoke, 
nor yet any sound, and a bustle and stir among the little figures. So much for the hill. Immediately over the rear truck of the train, a huge white ball of smoke sprang into being and tore out into a cone like a comet. Then came the explosions of the near guns and the nearer shell. The iron sides of the truck tanged with the patter of bullets. There was a crash from the front of the train and half a dozen sharp reports. The Boers had opened fire on us at 600 yards with two large field guns, a Maxim firing small shells in a stream, and from riflemen lying on the ridge. I got down from my box into the cover of the armored sides of the car without forming any clear thought. Equally involuntarily, it seems that the driver put on full steam, as the enemy had intended. The train leapt forward, ran the gauntlet of the guns, which now filled the air with explosions, swung round the curve of the hill, ran down a steep gradient, and dashed into a huge stone which awaited it on the line at a convenient spot. To those who were in the rear truck, there was only a tremendous shock, a tremendous crash, and a sudden full stop. What happened to the trucks in front of the engine is more interesting. The first, which contained the materials and tools of the breakdown gang and the guard who was watching the line, was flung into the air and fell bottom upwards on the embankment. I do not know what befell the guard, but it seems probable that he was killed. The next, an armored car crowded with the Durban light infantry was carried on 20 yards and thrown over on its side, scattering its occupants in a shower on the ground. The third wedged itself across the track, half on and half off the rails. The rest of the train kept to the metals. We were not long left in the comparative peace and safety of a railway accident. The war guns swiftly changed their position, reopened from a distance of 1,300 yards before anyone had got out of the stage of exclamations. The tapping rifle fire spread along the hillside until it encircled the wreckage on all three sides, and a third field gun came into action from some high ground on the opposite side of the line. To all of this, our own poor little gun endeavored to reply, and the sailors, though exposed in an open truck, succeeded in letting off three rounds before the barrel was struck by a shell and the trunnions being smashed, fell altogether out of the carriage. The armored truck gave some protection from the bullets, but since any direct shell must pierce it like paper and kill everyone, it seemed almost safer outside. And, wishing to see the extent and nature of the damage, I clambered over the iron shield and, dropping to the ground, ran along the line to the front of the train. As I passed the engine, another shrapnel shell burst immediately, as it seemed, overhead, hurling its contents with a rasping rush through the air. The driver at once sprang out of the cab and ran to the shelter of the overturned trucks. His face was cut open by a splinter, and he complained in bitter, futile indignation. He was a civilian. What did they think he was paid for? To be killed by bombshells? Not he. He would not stay another minute. It looked as if his excitement and misery, he was dazed by the blow on his head, would prevent him from working the engine further. And as only he understood the machinery, all chances of escape seemed to be cut off. Yet when I told this man that if he continued to stay at his post, he would be mentioned for the distinguished gallantry in action, he pulled himself together wiped the blood off his face, climbed back into the cab of his engine, and thereafter, during the one-sided combat, did his duty bravely and faithfully. So strong is the desire for honor and repute in the human breast. I reached the overturned portion of the train uninjured. The volunteers, who, though severely shaken, were mostly unhurt, were lying down under such cover as the damaged cars and the gutters of the railway line afforded. It was a very grievous sight to see these citizen soldiers, 
most of whom were the fathers of families, in such a perilous position. They bore themselves well, though greatly troubled, and their major, whose name I have not learned, directed their fire on the enemy. But since these, lying behind the crests of the surrounding hills, were almost invisible, I did not expect that it would be very effective. Having seen this much, I ran along the train to the rear armored truck and told Captain Haldane that in my opinion the line might be cleared. We then agreed that he with musketry should keep the enemy's artillery from destroying us, and that I should try to throw the wreckage off the line, so that the engine and the two cars which still remained on the rails might escape. I am convinced that this arrangement gave us the best possible chance of safety, though at the time, the position appeared quite hopeless. Accordingly, Holdane and his fusiliers began to fire through their loopholes at the Boer artillery, and, as the enemy afterwards admitted, actually disturbed their aim considerably. During the time that these men were firing from the truck, four shells passed through the armor, but luckily not one exploded until it had passed out on the further side. Many shells also struck and burst on the outside of their shields, and these knocked all the soldiers on their backs with the concussion. Nevertheless, a well-directed fire was maintained without cessation. End quote. Churchill and soldiers worked frantically for over an hour to get derailed train cars completely off the track and to detach the engine-bearing part of the train from the train cars that were too far derailed. The hope was to get the train engine enough momentum to burst through obstacles that had fallen in their path. And you know what? The train engine did smash through obstacles and had a smooth train line ahead. As many wounded as possible were loaded onto this train with the hope of escape. All this while war artillery exploded around them and Maxim machine gun fire pelted all around them. Churchill describes what the Maxim shells did as this British contingent tried to escape. Quote, One I remember struck the footplate of the engine scarcely a yard from my face, lit up into a bright yellow flash, and left me wondering why I was still alive. Another hit the coals in the tender, hurling a black shower into the air. A third, this also I saw, struck the arm of a private in the Dublin Fusiliers. The whole arm was smashed to a horrid pulp, bones, muscle, blood, and uniform all mixed together. At the bottom hung the hand, unhurt, but swelled instantly to three times its ordinary size. Churchill continues, The engine was soon crowded and began to steam homewards, a mournful, sorely battered locomotive with the woodwork of the firebox in flames and the water spouting from its pierced tanks. The infantrymen straggled along beside it at the double. Seeing the engine escaping, the Boers increased their fire, and the troops, hitherto somewhat protected by the iron trucks, began to suffer. The major of volunteers fell, shot through the thigh. Here and there, men dropped on the ground. Several screamed. This is very rare in war, and cried for help. About a quarter of the force was very soon killed or wounded. The shells, which pursued the retreating soldiers, scattered them all along the track. Order and control vanished. The engine, increasing its pace, drew out from the thin crowd of fugitives and was soon in safety. The infantry continued to run down the line in the direction of the houses, and, in spite of their disorder, I honestly consider that they were capable of making a further resistance when some shelter should be reached. But at this moment, one of those miserable incidents, much too frequent in this war, occurred. A private soldier who was wounded, in direct disobedience of the positive orders that no surrender was to be made, took it on himself to wave a pocket handkerchief. The Boers immediately ceased firing, and with equal daring and humanity, a dozen horsemen galloped from the hills into the scattered fugitives, scarcely any of whom had seen the white flag, and several of whom were still firing, and called loudly on them to surrender. Most of the soldiers, 
uncertain what to do, then halted, gave up their arms, and became prisoners of war. Those further away from the horsemen continued to run and were shot or hunted down in twos and threes, and some made good their escape. End quote. Churchill, on the other hand, still sat aboard the armored train next to the man with the shattered arm, still hopeful of escaping. Then he jumped off the train towards a group of houses where some British soldiers had planned to make a last stand of sorts. Then, the next, much longer phase of Churchill's adventure began. Churchill writes, Scarcely had the locomotive left me than I found myself alone in a shallow cutting, and none of our soldiers, who had all surrendered on the way, to be seen. Then suddenly there appeared on the line at the end of the cutting two men not in uniform. Plate layers, I said to myself, and then with a surge of realization, boars. My mind retains a momentary impression of these tall figures, full of animated movement, clad in dark flapping clothes, with slouch, storm-driven hats poising on their rifles hardly a hundred yards away. I turned and ran between the rails of the track, and the only thought I achieved was this, war marksmanship. Two bullets passed, both within a foot, one on either side. I flung myself against the banks of the cutting, but they gave no cover. Another glance at the figures, one was now kneeling to aim. Again, I darted forward. Movement seemed the only chance. Again, two soft kisses sucked in the air, but nothing struck me. This could not endure. I must get out of the cutting, that damnable corridor. I scrambled up the bank. The earth sprang up beside me and something touched my hand, but outside the cutting was a tiny depression. I slouched in this, struggling to get my wind. On the other side of the railway, a horseman galloped up, shouting to me and waving his hand. He was scarcely 40 yards off. With a rifle, I could have killed him easily. I knew nothing of white flags, and the bullets had made me savage. I reached down for my Mauser pistol. This one, at least, I said, and indeed, it was a certainty. But alas, I had left the weapon in the cab of the engine in order to be free to work at the wreckage. What then? There was a wire fence between me and the horseman. Should I continue to fly? The idea of another shot at such short range decided me. Death stood before me, grim, sullen death, without his light-hearted companion, Chance. So I held up my hand, and like Mr. Jorok's foxes, cried, Capavi. Then I was herded with the other prisoners in a miserable group, and about the same time I noticed that my hand was bleeding, and it began to pour with rain. Two days before, I had written to an officer in high command at home whose friendship I have the honor to enjoy. There has been a great deal too much surrendering in this war, and I hope people who do so will not be encouraged. Fate had intervened, yet though her tone was full of irony, she seemed to say to me, as I think Ruskin once said, it matters very little whether your judgments of people are true or untrue, and very much whether they are kind or unkind. And repeating that, I will make an end. Winston afterwards claimed that Louis Boita himself captured Winston. But this was impossible. It was likely that a field cornet named Ustheisen captured Churchill. Pakenan claims that Churchill appears to have urged the officer commanding the armored train, Captain Holdane, not to turn back when they saw the signs of Boita's trap. These claims obviously are disputed. Regardless of what happened, this capture may have been the best thing to happen to Churchill. His time as a POW would add to his fame, his fame that would help him win his first seat in Parliament. But now we are getting a little ahead of ourselves. Jobert and Boita had much more pressing matters to mind after they attacked Churchill's armored train. They drove deeper south. Jobert sought to cut off Estcourt from the rest of the British forces, not to storm Estcourt. He and Boita led 1,500 men one way, while Jobert's nephew David, with 600 men, went another way. 
Something I found funny is that when the Boers took a break from their drive south on Sunday, November 19th, men of the Heidelberg Commando attended church not once, not twice, not thrice, but four times, four church services in a day. How about that? Pete and David's men linked up again at Willow Hransi, with Jobert still skittish about possibly running into a larger British force. Pete Jobert had unknowingly slipped his approximately 2,000 men between two British brigades, totaling nearly 10,000 men. The Roslyn Castle had docked at Durban on November 12th, with a stream of troops and cattle trucks flowing up the railway line since then. The British launched an uncoordinated attack on Jobert's forces on November 22nd, as lightning and hail raged. As it turned out, the storm claimed more casualties than this abortive British attack. The storm killed one war and six horses. The British, on the other hand, suffered 86 casualties at Willow Hransi. George Fitzpatrick of the Imperial Light Horse died in action. George was the brother of one of our characters from episode 20, Percy Fitzpatrick. Louis Boita swelled with confidence after this tactical victory and called for heading for Durban and its bananas. But before the Transvaal Wars could hold their council of war, another general fell. Pete Yobert's horse threw him to the ground, causing consequential internal injuries. Yobert would never recover. Yobert even urged President Creer via telegram to make peace with the British as soon as possible. Creer immediately rejected this. Yobert proposed an immediate retreat to the Transvaal War's War Council, and the War Council approved. Yobert received an escort home while the rest of the Boers headed north, back across the Tugela River. The Boers had driven deep into the towel, but with little to show for it. At the northern banks of the Tugela, with its naturally strong defensive position, the Boers awaited the British. Louis Boita took command of the Transvaal Boers and the fortifying of their Tugela line. The Boers, on the backs of forced black labor, dug and built up 15 miles of rifle pits, gun pits, dummy trenches, false gun emplacements, all this hewn out of red banks littered with boulders. When all was said and done, 5,000 war riflemen and 10 field guns lay in wait for the British. If the British advanced towards this Tugela line, they wouldn't see a single war until it was too late. 